Episode number 245. Where did you learn all this sort of thing? He asked with a quizzical look. As this sort of thing is rather a vague expression, would you kindly explain? Returned Amy, knowing perfectly well what he meant, but wickedly leaving him to describe what is indescribable. Well, the general air, the style, the self-possession, the, the, illusion, you know, laughed Lori, breaking down and helping himself out of his quandary with the new word. Amy was gratified, but of course didn't show it, and demurely answered, Foreign life polishes one in spite of one's self. I study as well as play, and as for this, with a little gesture toward her dress, why, tall is cheap, poses to be had for nothing, and I'm used to making the most of my poor little things. Amy rather regretted that last sentence, fearing it wasn't in good taste, but Laurie liked her better for it, and found himself both admiring and respecting the brave patience that made the most of opportunity, and the cheerful spirit that covered poverty with flowers. Amy did not know why he looked at her so kindly, nor why he filled up her book with his own name, and devoted himself to her for the rest of the evening in the most delightful manner. But the impulse that wrought this agreeable change was the result of one of the new impressions which both of them were unconsciously giving and receiving. Chapter 38 On the Shelf In France the young girls have a dull time of it till they're married, when, vive la liberté, becomes their motto. In America, as everyone knows, girls early sign the Declaration of Independence, and enjoy their freedom with a Republican zest. But the young matrons usually abdicate with the first heir to the throne, and go into a seclusion almost as close as a French nunnery, though by no means as quiet. Whether they like it, or not, they're virtually put upon the shelf as soon as the wedding excitement is over, and most of them might exclaim, as did a very pretty woman the other day, I'm as handsome as ever, but no one takes any notice of me, because I'm married. Not being a belle, or even a fashionable lady, Meg did not experience this affliction till her babies were a year old, for in her little world primitive customs prevailed, and she found herself more admired and beloved than ever. As she was a womanly little woman, the maternal instinct was very strong, and she was entirely absorbed in her children, to the utter exclusion of everything and everybody else. Day and night she brooded over them with tireless devotion and anxiety, leaving John to the tender mercies of the help. The Irish lady now presided over the kitchen department. Being a domestic man, John decidedly missed the wifely attentions he had been accustomed to receive, but as he adored his babies, he cheerfully relinquished his comfort for time, supposing with masculine ignorance that peace would soon be restored. But three months passed and there was no return of repose. Meg looked worn and nervous, the babies absorbed every minute of her time, the house was neglected, and Kitty, the cook, who took life easy, kept him on short commons. When he went out in the morning he was bewildered by small commissions for the captive mamma, if he came gaily at night, eager to embrace his family, he was quenched by a hush. They're just asleep after worrying all day. If he proposed a little amusement at home, no, it would disturb the babies. If he hindered at a lecture or a concert, he was answered with a reproachful look, and decided, leave my children for pleasure, never. His sleep was broken by infant wails and visions of a fandom figure pacing noiselessly to and fro in the watches of the night. His meals were interrupted by the frequent flight of the presiding genius, who deserted him, half helped if a muffled chirp sounded from the nest above. And when he read his paper of an evening, Emmy's colic got into the shipping list, and Daisy's fall affected the price of stocks, for Mrs. Brooke was only interested in domestic news. 